The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost, it's lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. 44 versus 45. Obama versus Trump. The battle is joined. Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and syndicated from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Barack Obama emerges from the shadows and comes out swinging, guns a-blazing against the man who succeeded him in the Oval Office. We will frame the battle ahead as two presidents hit the campaign trail hard with control of Congress at stake in midterm elections now less than two months away. The far left finds a way to blame President Trump for Hurricane Florence even before it hit because of his belief that the climate change paranoia is a hoax and because of his claim that the federal response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico was an incredible unsung success. Google is exposed with the release of a video unmasking the Internet giant's singular left-wing culture and naked attempts to prop up the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. And LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza jumps on board for Talkin' Liberty featuring Democrats using a handshake or lack thereof to try and sink Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, plus threats and promising developments regarding your individual liberty. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. Commence the festivities with our signature segment, Say What, where we roll out some of the most wacky, astonishing, and damnable things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. And it was a week for not just a hurricane, as Florence bore down on the Carolinas and delivered a drenching and devastating rain, but the politics of hurricanes. It started with a bold claim by President Trump about his administration's response to Hurricanes Maria and Irma in Puerto Rico last year. Puerto Rico was an incredible, unsung success. So everyone, it seems, was waiting to jump on the ain't it awful bandwagon after that statement. Using an academic study from George Washington University commissioned by the government of Puerto Rico, using some sort of formula that made the number of deaths from the two hurricanes jump from 18 when Trump left the island to almost 3,000 apparently by simply comparing the number of deaths in the last year to the number from the same time the year before. But Democrats like Joe Biden, Republicans like Paul Ryan, and the governor of Puerto Rico himself, Ricardo Rossello, gave the Trump haters exactly what they wanted to hear. By the way, there are no problems in America. Uh, Everybody's doing well. Uh, Things are fair and decent, and no one died in Puerto Rico. I mean, casualties don't make a person look bad. That's not. Uh, so I have no reason to dispute these numbers. The victims and uh, the people of Puerto Rico should not have their pain questioned. Of course, this is a perfect opportunity for the left and the establishment to pounce and virtue signal. Because we will never really be able to determine how many of the deaths in Puerto Rico were because of the federal response to an island 1,000 miles from the mainland or the response of the Puerto Rican government, which is famously, how shall we say, of questionable competence. But the media ran with those numbers unquestioningly 
and led one of the most prominent victims of Trump derangement syndrome, the formerly respectable Jeffrey Tubin on, of course, CNN, to take the opportunity to repeat his assertion that this is not just a political miscalculation because President Trump is a white supremacist. Isn't the story even darker than that? Isn't the story that these people who died, apparently thousands of them in Puerto Rico, they're not white people Mm -hmm. and they don't count. You know, that kind of claim, which would be scandalous in any other political age, calling someone a white supremacist is now so common on the left that it's hardly even noticed anymore. But if you want to know how crazy things have gotten on the left, one of the people actually considering running for the Democratic nomination for president in 2020 is the lawyer, or as I prefer to call him, ambulance chaser, the lawyer for Stormy Daniels, who slapped a lawsuit on Trump, Michael Avenatti. I'm continuing to travel around the country. I'm meeting with people. I'm talking with people. I'm gauging the interest. People have been very enthusiastic. I promise you I'll decide by April. You'll decide by April. I promise you that. So the headline here, Michael Avenatti seriously considering a presidential run and will decide yes or no by April. Well, truth is, as we've always known, far stranger than fiction. Michael Avenatti for president. Meanwhile, remember that anonymous letter from someone in the White House that was published in the New York Times? While most in the elite media used it as an opportunity to decry Donald Trump and his administration, there were a couple of small cracks in the armor which are worthy of note. On the issue of whether someone in the White House using his position to oppose the man who appointed him, the President of the United States, represents a cabal or soft coup d'etat. Now, listen carefully to the host of Meet the Press, leftist Chuck Todd, and his guest, Democratic strategist Cornell Belcher, quietly admit the shocking reality of what Mr. Anonymous revealed. This is disturbing on one hand because unelected cabal. I am, yes, disturbed by what, what, what appears to be a soft coup, right? Okay, did you hear that? Those are leftists admitting that Mr. Anonymous was subverting our republic by interfering with the operations of a duly elected president. But it was significant in another way. Here's House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. If you ever wondered, is there a deep state? Is there somebody high in government? that will hide behind media to work against the voters of America and create a constitutional crisis, it's proven today that it is. There you have it. Mr. Anonymous unwittingly providing proof positive that the deep state is very real. Up next, Trump versus Obama in a battle of heavyweights. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel and get our Truth is Making a Comeback. America's Top Stories with LN Editor-in-Chief Lisa K. Donner, an alternative to the leftist programs on TV. Five facts, just the facts, ma'am, without the liberal bias. Ellen Radio, syndicated from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Listen to all the big names in politics with your host, Tim Donner. Ellen TV, the right analysis with our Liberty Nation authors from across the globe. The Uprising Podcast, fun and entertaining commentary on what's really going on in the swamp with Scott Cosenza and Tim Donner. All this and more when you subscribe to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel today because truth, 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 truth. Is making a comeback. We believe that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. A battle of titans, Obama versus Trump, will now frame the seven weeks or so leading up to the 2018 midterm elections. 
After the 44th president emerged from the shadows and his home just miles from the White House to attack the 45th president with a full frontal assault, revealing pent up frustration and boiling anger built up over the almost 20 months since he and his ideological soulmate Hillary Clinton were beaten or repudiated in the most shocking result in the history of the American Republic, Barack Obama broke with history, becoming the first president maybe ever to attack his successor by name with seething anger oozing out of his every pore, it seemed, using talking points that will form the basis of Democrats' attack on Trump in the weeks ahead. Obama based his attack on three basic premises, the first being that Trump is using the power of the federal government to attack his political opponents. It should not be Democratic or Republican. It should not be a partisan issue to say that we do not pressure the attorney general or the FBI to use the criminal justice system as a cudgel to punish our political opponents. Now, he said that because Trump said maybe the attorney general should look into the guy in the White House who wrote that anonymous letter last week in the New York Times attacking the president who appointed him, thus putting the lie to the notion that the deep state is just a figment of Trump's imagination. But how about that claim that Trump is using the power of the Justice Department to punish political opponents? This from the man whose internal revenue service thwarted hundreds of upstart conservative organizations, an issue that's been litigated with a settlement of over three million dollars reached with the Justice Department in recent months. Now, you want to know what using the power of the federal government to shut down dissent is like? Well, let me tell you, it took 28 months for our nonprofit one generation away to receive nonprofit status and a tax exemption. And we were approved six days after Obama was reelected, six days after. And then one year later, we were informed that our exemption had been removed because they claimed to have never received our tax form, the 990 For three straight years, even though all three returns were sent to the one address where all nonprofit returns are sent out in Utah. Now, it's possible to lose one return. Two is unlikely at best. And to lose three returns in three years is close to a physical impossibility. But our nonprofit status was taken away by the Obama IRS And it took almost two years and $35,000 to get it back. Two years and $35,000. And Obama attacks Trump for using the power of the federal government to shut down his political opponents, which is not only utter hypocrisy, but not even true. Trump has not made one move to have his Justice Department try and shut down his opponents. Not one. But Obama moved on to his second attack on Trump, that he is threatening the First Amendment. It shouldn't be Democratic or Republican to say that we don't threaten the freedom of the press because they say things or publish stories we don't like. I complain plenty about Fox News. But you never heard me... Threatened to shut him down. No, his administration just spied on reporters from Fox News and the Associated Press and others. It's on the record, folks. Now, this is from the Washington Post, anything but a conservative vessel. Quote, under Obama, the Justice Department subpoenaed the telephone records of AP journalists as investigators pursued a leak. It also went after Fox News reporter James Rosen and named him as a co-conspirator in a leak about North Korea's nuclear program. And James Risen, then a New York Times reporter, struggled for years to avoid testifying about his confidential source during the leak investigation of Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA officer. The pursuit of Rosen, again from Fox News, may have been the most extreme of all the Obama-era cases. The Justice Department used security badge access records to track his comings and goings 
from the State Department. That's from the Washington Post. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I wish Trump would say this media is the enemy of the people, which is obviously what he means, instead of the media is the enemy of the people. But he's actually done nothing to actually limit freedom of the press. What Trump says in words, Obama did with his actions. But Obama was just getting warmed up. Next, he went after Trump as a Muslim hater and coddler of white supremacists. We don't target certain groups of people based on what they look like or how they pray. We are Americans. We're supposed to stand up to bullies. We're supposed to stand up to discrimination. And we're sure as heck supposed to stand up clearly and unequivocally to Nazi sympathizers. How hard can that be? I wonder where the basket of deplorables falls in the line of hating on people's way of life and political beliefs. And when Trump said there were good people on both sides in the Charlottesville ugliness, he meant that there were people who legitimately objected to the forcible removal of history by a politically correct government trying to expunge all traces of the losing side in the Civil War. But Obama broadened his attacks to conservatives writ large. It did not start with Donald Trump. He is a symptom, not the cause. He's just capitalizing on resentments that politicians have been fanning for years. And finally, the 44th president went specifically after the Republicans in Congress. They're not doing us a service by actively promoting 90 percent of the crazy stuff that's coming out of this White House and then saying, don't worry, we're preventing the other 10 percent. The crazy stuff coming out of this White House, leading to an economy firing on all cylinders, record low unemployment across the board, soaring consumer and business confidence in numbers Obama didn't come close to achieving in his eight years. And, of course, the current president had one simple and typical reaction to Obama's diatribe. I'm sorry I watched it, but I fell asleep. (laughs) I found he's very good, very good for sleeping. So the choice between Republicans and Democrats this year is as stark a choice as we've ever seen. Republicans touting the strongest economy we've seen in years, four million new jobs and record low unemployment. Democrats touting their hatred for Donald Trump and their promise to do anything and everything to make sure his agenda is stalled at a minimum, but ideally his removal from office by whatever means present themselves. You might have expected the Democrats to add some sort of positive message to their campaign, but none has been forthcoming. So many Democrats running for Congress are trying to localize their races, even in many cases promising to oppose Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House if they gain the majority in the House of Representatives and to reject every one of the president's judicial nominees in the Senate. So Obama joins the battle And we'll see which of the two dramatically conflicting visions of America the voters choose this time. Up next, Google Unmasked. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours, the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network. And a shout out to those of you listening on WAMY 1580 AM and WWZQ 1240 AM in Tupelo, Mississippi, the birthplace of Elvis Presley, who is still dead or still alive, depending on who you talk to. And also, of course, the home of Tupelo Honey, delicious to say the least. Well, 
it wasn't as if we didn't already know it, but in this last week, the mask was pulled off of Google, the Internet giant, with two revelations about the singular left-wing culture permeating Google. Someone released a confidential video of the company's top 100 executives' weekly get-together three days after the 2016 election, which started with a statement by Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google and president of their parent company called Alphabet, decrying the results of the election. You know, let's face it, most uh, people here are uh, pretty upset and pretty sad for uh, because of the election. As an immigrant and a refugee, um, I, I certainly find this election uh, deeply offensive, and I know many of you do, too. So there you heard palpable sadness, but it was revealed at an even deeper emotional level by Google Vice President Eileen Norton. As we started to see the direction of the voting, I reached out to someone close to me who was at the Javits Center where the big celebration was supposed to occur in New York City, somebody who had been working on the campaign. And um, I just sent him a note and said, you know, are you okay? It looks like it's going the wrong way. And I got back a very sad, short text um, that read, people are leaving, staff is crying, we're going to lose. That was the first moment I really felt like we were going to lose. And it was this massive, like, kick in the gut. Kick in the gut. But Google tried to claim the fact that the entire senior management there was invested emotionally in the election of Hillary Clinton. And like most on the left thought, Donald Trump would not, could not ever be elected president did not influence their operations or their search results, even though you can go on Google right now and put in Donald Trump and, for example, uh, get nothing but negative stories over 90 percent of the time. But things got kicked into an even higher gear with credible reports that Google had made what's being called a silent donation meant to circumvent campaign finance laws in the hopes no one would notice to a left wing group called Voto Latino, which was trying to get Latinos to the polls to vote for Hillary. And the spokesman for that group was shocked and outraged that 30 percent of Hispanics voted for Trump when they thought it would likely be, say, zero percent. Now, I liken this whole thing to the Peter Strzok affair. Strzok, you will recall, was the FBI chief of counterespionage who exchanged dozens of texts with his paramour and colleague Lisa Page about how much they hate Trump, how they'd create an insurance policy to make sure Trump didn't get elected, called Trump supporters hillbillies who smell and who with an unrelenting smirk, testified before Congress that his opinion of Trump had no influence on his role as the lead investigator in both the Hillary Clinton email scandal and Russian interference in the election, which, of course, ultimately led to the appointment of a special counsel. Remember when Strzok tried to explain it all away? Let me be clear, unequivocally and under oath, Not once in my 26 years of defending our nation did my personal opinions impact any official action I took. And they call Trump a liar. You see, what Google and Peter Strzok and Mr. Anonymous in the New York Times prove is that the deep state consisting of intelligence operatives, the political establishment, left-wing interest groups with the aid and support of the elite media have an unrelenting bias against Trump, but try to claim it has no effect on their jobs. And if you believe that, there's some swampland in the Everglades and a bridge in Brooklyn we could discuss. Up next, Talk and Liberty, Democrats using a handshake, or lack thereof, to try and sink Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel and get our Truth is Making a Comeback. 
America's Top Stories with LN Editor-in-Chief Lisa K. Donner, an alternative to the leftist programs on TV. Five facts, just the facts, ma'am, without the liberal bias. LN Radio, syndicated from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Listen to all the big names in politics with your host, Tim Donner. LN TV, the right analysis with our Liberty Nation authors from across the globe. The Uprising Podcast, fun and entertaining commentary on what's really going on in the swamp with Scott Cosenza and Tim Donner. All this and more when you subscribe to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel today because truth, 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 truth is making a comeback. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Just talking loud, just say nothing. We welcome you in now to the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitle Talking Liberty, as we welcome in our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer, and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, Scott Cosenza. Brett Kavanaugh, we can't avoid it. Uh, but the, the, the developments this week, which you're going to talk about, don't really have anything to do with the hearing per se, do they? The uh, the circus packed up its tent and went away, Tim. So, no, we're, <laughs> we're done with the hearing. These are what I wanted to talk about very briefly was the uh, some. Uh, Kavanaugh has submitted his answers to the written questions that were submitted by the senators. Uh, and the one that I want to focus on concerns uh, whether or not he refused to shake uh, shake the hand of the father of a victim of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School massacre. And the stories were uh, promulgated far and wide last week that at the conclusion of the hearing, he declined to shake the man's hand. And then, of course, everybody got to opine about what that meant for them. Mm-hmm. I said at the time, we don't know if he declined to shake the man's hand because we don't know if he, he knew who the man was or why he had approached him. All we know is that he didn't shake the man's hand. And to say anything more would be a lie. Well, anyway, Judge Kavanaugh has submitted his responses under oath, and he has stated under oath that at the conclusion of the hearing... So he's perjured himself. <laughs> that'll be the next okay. thing, right? Yeah, right. He has said at the conclusion of the hearing. It, said, it actually said, did you refuse to shake uh, what's his name's hand? And he said, you know, he said quite clearly, I didn't know who it was at the conclusion of the hearing. I got up to leave. A man yelled at, yelled at and approached me from behind and I didn't. If I had known who he was, I would have shaken his hand and I would have talked to him and I would have listened to him and expressed my condolences. The, the implication in all this uh, among the establishment, leftist, elite, legacy media, I'm trying to get all the adjectives in, legacy. is that he specifically chose not to shake his hand right. because he was the, the parent of the a fake Marjorie. Son. I mean, to, to believe that I don't... I, I'm I'm yeah. a, my mouth is yeah. agape at the thought that people would say he deliberately at some shunned point, uh, the father of a victim of a mass you know, school something shooting. I've been thinking about quite a bit in the last week is at what point do you say to people who have these views? I don't think we can really coexist under the same system. I mean, we're dealing with such a different set of realities, right? Uh, how can we coexist? What about this cryptic letter unveiled by Senator Dianne not Feinstein? Un, not un, oh, excuse me, Tim. No, it hasn't been unveiled. You're doing exactly... The fact of it existing, supposedly, has been unveiled. So what you're talking yes. about, for people who don't know, is that there is a story afoot in some sort of uh, sort of the DC media that there that Diane Feinstein sent a letter that she received or forwarded a letter that she received about Judge Kavanaugh from one of her constituents to the FBI for investigation and that she isn't revealing what the letter said to any of her colleagues on the committee. Now, the fact that we're talking about the story is a result of the fact yeah. that Diane Feinstein mm-hmm. public 
published uh, details of this to her, her, her friends in the media, who then published the story about this letter. You know how many letters Diane Feinstein gets? How many do you know about, Tim? None, right? Because she hasn't told us about them. She never responded to mine. Oh, wait, I never sent her oh, one. I, I think I, back when she was, uh, <laughs> I, I think I've sent her one or two. On the gun control uh, issue, yeah, of for course. Sure. But, um, you know, the reason why we're talking about it is... That's the reason why, because she wants us to. Uh, we have mm-hmm. no information about this, what it may contain. It's just a drive-by sort of besmirching uh, of the judge's character. And, again, it's going to be used in an attempt, hopefully, I think, uh, a, a fruitless attempt to delay the process of his nomination. The idea that a man who has sit for over 10 years on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals is an unknown choice. I mean, yeah. that will be... We don't know what he really that's thinks. That's better than any David Copperfield yeah, trick ever just, pulled, if they can actually convince the, people the, the guy, that, that he is an unknown. The he's guy the has, most known in the world. He's written 300 opinions in his... Uh, judgeship on the appellate court. Tim, are you aware opinions? that he once worked for a few months uh, at a distance for a man who was later uh, tried and convicted in the court of public opinion uh, and in the Me Too for sexual harassment? How can you say he's qualified to be a Supreme Court judge? He worked so, for that guy for for at least, I think, at least nine months. It's uh, called the uh, twenty it, years ago. It's called six degrees of separation, and all six degrees he's going to be held accountable for. A guy who knows a guy who knows That's a guy right. says that he said this, and well, it's just it's like really, the uh, um, is it Maisie, what, the woman from Hawaii? Um, she she just totally acted like he was a racist against Hawaiians for some reason. Or, you mean he's not? <laughs> in, a, in a program in Hawaii. By the way, the Hawaii government is not allowed to be racist uh, against black people in favor of Hawaiians, which is what they were doing in that program that the judge ruled against. By the way, not because it was his own preference to, to say that Hawaii shouldn't, Hawaiians shouldn't be racist against blacks and Hispanics, but because federal law demands it. Okay, Again, so there's another, another instance of the judge asserting uh, asserting the law and Democrats denigrating him as if it were his personal preference. The strategy of the Democrats at this point can be summed up in three words, Scott. Whatever it takes. And in the D.C. echo chamber, it's going to be like the story that came out that, as it turns out, 3,000 people almost died in the in Hurricane Maria mm-hmm. in San Juan because a bunch of academics ran some uh, some algorithms to figure out how many died beyond the 18 that were reported that wouldn't have died if it wasn't for the hurricane. Mm-hmm. And now it's being quoted as gospel right. within uh, Washington, D.C. But we moved to issues that affect me, individual people's liberty. Quick question? I'm guessing they weren't saying that was the fault of every Democrat in office in Puerto Rico who respond, that it's Donald Trump's fault. Right? No, That's they're the all <laughs> paragons right, of effective right. leadership, yeah. Scott. Illinois governor vetoes bill meant to cripple rental car competition. This is the Republican governor of Illinois who has vetoed a bill that would have made it more difficult for these offline I'd call them Uber-like apps where you can rent a car from someone who's willing to rent it to you. But uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car steps in and... Well, Tim, before we do that, you know, speaking of party politics, did you know that the governor of Illinois was a uh, a Republican? I, I didn't realize Well, that. Massachusetts has a yeah. Republican governor. It's surprising. As, as, as I guess said, I just think of Chicago as like locked down Democrat city. So, you know, so well, endemic. Th- th- but this this happens. Of course, that's your Chicago. But but Illinois is one of the most blue states in the country. But like Massachusetts. What I like to say about states like that is they like to stand up on the soapbox and stand for all these leftist policies, but they want to have a Republican governor to make sure they don't have to pay for them. See see how that works? Okay, so the car rental thing. Like so many large corporations, they try to use the government to to 
to use their boot to step on their competitors because actually competing in the marketplace, as anybody who's ever tried it knows, is quite difficult. It's much easier to buy a few legislators or more than a few legislators and have the government put their boot on the the, the neck of your competition. And, uh, you know, why do you think Enterprise would be so interested in who gets to rent, rent a car and who doesn't after they've gotten, you know, the ability to do so? Uh, it's pretty gross, and uh, I think we need to really celebrate uh, Governor Rauner uh, for his veto and hope that uh, the that Illinois celebrates the free market and doesn't try to stifle innovation. This is what you call crony capitalism, oh, yeah. which is no capitalism Thank at you. all. Now, in California, the gig economy, the idea that you, you don't go to work in a suit at nine in the morning and work till five and come home and maybe get your you, guaranteed maybe, paycheck. Maybe you drive some in Illinois, you do. <laughs> no, but, they, but they don't like that in California. Yeah. They don't want you to be anything but an employee who, play, who pays taxes. So they're taking steps and attacking the gig economy in various ways, well, think, which is uh, hurting uh, neighborhood mm-hmm. barbers, tattoo artists. I, I love how you noted that it was tattoo well, artists victimized by this. There, there are, you know, a tattoo artist and a barber are similar in the way they apply their trade, Tim, usually, which is that they rent a chair at a place and then they're responsible. They basically pay rent on that chair. So the barbershop is open from whatever it may be, a clock to whatever o'clock. And you can work one hour during that day if you want to, or you can work every hour during that day if you want to. Um, maybe they get a percentage of each customer's take, then uh, some rental fee, and the same is often true uh, with tattoo parlors. And taxes is the key thing I think you said there, which yeah. is that the state feels like it's being cut out of. Right. They're not getting their cut. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. They, you know the. the you know, if you look at the government like an organized crime model, and I do favor uh, <laughs> that model in terms of how to analyze it, you know, the one thing that you can't do is not pay them their cut uh, or they will get violent with right. you. And that's what we right. have here. Um, and what it does, of course, is, you know, when they sell the the policy uh, in the legislature, they sell it as uh, – uh, large corporations are exploiting you, the you know the right. little guy right by right. not by not doing uh, what's bo- you know getting them on the books. Of course, these people <clears throat> are working under the basis no. of being an independent contractor, so they're exploiting yes. people who are choosing freely to work in a it, in a gig job. That's right. So to speak. And in fact, they have there was a, there was a story uh, out of Sacramento uh, that uh, this guy lost all seven of his barbers uh, had to leave because the previously you know if you want to take on somebody if you have the room in your barber shop well it doesn't cost you anything to take on a new barber right if somebody wants to be a barber and they have their certificate or whatever sure come on in i'll take a cut of whoever you bring in to cut their hair sure well now i have to pay you minimum wage which by the way they keep jacking up in california i don't even know what it's probably 50 bucks an hour <laughs> last i looked um, it was in double digits no, for that's real. all I and can so tell now you. i have to be on the hook and also all the record keeping now that's required you know these reg- regulations that are passed by people who never employed anybody right, right? precisely that, uh, yeah Quickly, one more story. Woman in Illinois. We said something good about Illinois before because of the governor. But now a mom there is speaking out about being investigated for child abuse because she let her eight-year-old daughter walk the dog. I, you can't make this stuff up. Marshmallow needed to go out for a walk, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and what a great uh, Corey, name. Corey Wyden, it was a Maltese, by the way. Corey Wyden thought that she would let her daughter, who could she, who she could see and hear for more than 50% of the trip from her vantage point in the yard, by the way, walk the dog literally around the block. Uh, and this isn't a complaint about the Illinois authorities so much as it is the people of Illinois or one of uh, Ms. Wyden's neighbors who called the police. The police investigated. They actually did the right thing uh, and said, you know, there was nothing to see here, right? So they did investigate, which was appropriate. They knocked on the door, were told what happened. And then the neighbor called the Department of Youth and Family Services uh, to, to further the complaint again. And uh, fortunately, um, Ms. Wyden has some resources, some attorney uh, acquaintances who specialize in this sort of case. And they fought it and they won. The, the, she's now out from under the thumb of the investigatory services. But you know, these are the people that have the authority without a hearing to take your child from you.
Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcast, The Uprising, are available to you on demand at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we'll be back at you next week. Same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying, stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio. Thank you.